Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Llewellyn Von Lee. Uh, welcome, Llewellyn. Hi. Nice to be here with you. Good to see you. I've uh, really enjoyed listening to you over the years. It's like poetry or something, listening to you speak. Um, I've seen you speak at the last couple of Science and Non-Duality conferences, and um, we missed you this year. You didn't make it to the conference, but it, I'm really uh, pleased to have you on the show. <clears throat> Let me read. Let me read a quick bio of you, and then we'll, we'll get into it. So Llewellyn Von Lee is a Sufi teacher and author. Born in London, he moved to Northern California in 1991 and founded the Golden Sufi Center. In recent years, the focus of his writing and teaching has been on spiritual responsibility in our present time of global crisis and an awakening global consciousness of oneness. More recently, he has written about the feminine and the emerging subject of spiritual ecology. He has been interviewed by Oprah Winfrey on Super Soul Sunday and featured on the Global Spirit series shown on PBS. His most recent book is Spiritual Ecology, Cry of the Earth, which is what we're going to be talking about today. <clears throat> now, uh, I thought that perhaps we could start, Llewellyn, by having you just give us a little bit of background about yourself, because some people might not be familiar with you. Um, and you do have quite an interesting story. Yes, I mean, I was born in a middle-class English household and sent to boarding school at the age of seven, which was a kind of English equivalent to the Tibetan monastery, I think. Mm. Um, and so I was at boarding school from seven to 17. And when I was 16, I had this experience that really changed me altogether, which was uh, precipitated or sparked by, by a Zen koan I read, the wild geese do not intend to cast their reflection the water has no mind to receive their image. And this Zen Cohen was like a, a key that opened a door inside of me I didn't even know existed. And I suddenly found myself present in a very, very different world. I mean, physically it was the same world, my boarding school environment, but suddenly it was full of light, it was full of joy, it was full of color that I didn't even know existed. I started to meditate in the Zen tradition of just emptiness and started to have experiences of a formless reality beyond the mind which was completely intoxicating, completely wonderful and uh, I loved it and uh, you know while other other people at the boarding school when the lights went out in the evening would uh, you know take their torch under the bedclothes to read some adolescent book I meditated and it was really really great and this, I left boarding school, I continued with this practice, but then there came a time when, when I was 18 and I began to realize that I needed to find a teacher. I couldn't go further in the meditation on my own. And this was, of course, the age before internet, before really even many workshops or anything. Spiritual things were very secretive and... Um, so you had to wait, and, but I met these people who belonged to a, um, a very secretive meditation group and they invited me to an esoteric talk on mathematics at the Kensington Library in London and I went there and found myself sitting behind a white-haired old lady with her hair tied up in a bun and after the talk we were introduced in the aisle of the lecture theatre and uh, I just had this experience, a really very visceral physical experience of becoming a speck of dust on the floor. She had these amazing, amazing blue eyes and she gave me one look from these blue eyes and I became just a speck of dust upon the floor. I had no idea what it meant. It wasn't, oh, for like six years that later I came across this Persian saying that the the disciple has to become less than the dust at the feet of the teacher. This ancient tradition of the annihilation of the false self, of the ego, so that one can experience reality or truth or one's real nature, however you call it. But at that time I had no awareness or understanding of what it might mean. I practiced Hatha Yoga, or I'd read some books on Taoism, which interested me, but I didn't know much about anything else, and uh, but then she invited me to her small meditation group, there were about eight of us at the time, in a very small English bed sitting room, what 
in America is eloquently referred to as a studio apartment, but there was not much of a studio space there. It was, you know, eight foot by ten foot, and there was so little space that Mrs. Tweedy would sit under the sink while we meditated. There was a, a bed and a chest of drawers and a, and a sink. And this is and the first time you mentioned her name, by the way, Mrs. Uh, yes. I, Irina Tweedy was her. Yes, this, this is... Uh, who wrote Daughter of Fire, right? Yes, this was before the, the book had come out, and mm -hmm. it was a very small group of us. She came back from... So this was in the early 70s, and she came back from India in 66, um, Mrs. Tweedy, as she liked to be called, when a teacher whom she referred to as Baisab, who was an Indian Sufi master when he passed on and he wanted her to bring the teachings of this particular Sufi lineage to the West so she came back to the West and started a very small meditation group and later her book came out first in its edited version Chasm of Fire and then in 87 in California and as a full version Daughter of Fire um, but at that time she was very unknown she lectured a little at the Theosophical Society and she was in her 60s then and we were a group of um, artists and students in our 20s so there was a big age group there were a few older people she used to refer to as the golden oldies and we were the spring fevers <laughs> and uh, and that was where, where it began so I really just sat there for um, you know week after week month after month year after year I met my wife Anat there and then when I was 26, her little her apartment was getting too small and I'd inherited some money so I bought a house and we lived upstairs and she and the group lived downstairs which is another form of uh, spiritual training mm -hmm. to live <laughs> upstairs above your teacher and all the people who came every day and then slowly she became better known and then she was, when I was uh, when I was about 30, she, I was sitting in her kitchen one afternoon and she said, at that time I was an English high school teacher, I taught Shakespeare and poetry. And I thought that was going to be my profession as an English high school teacher. And uh, one day when I was about 30, she passed by in the kitchen and said, you know, when you're 36, your life will change altogether. And I had absolutely no idea what she meant. But when I was 36, she sent me to lecture in America. She was too old to travel anymore. She had glaucoma and she couldn't travel. She'd uh, been there in 87, 85 and 87. She'd come to the Bay Area and um, and that's where it began. I spent three years traveling around America, lecturing mainly to Jungian associations at the time. I'd done a PhD on Jungian psychology and Shakespeare and talked about Jungian dream work and Sufism. Um, and then there was this extraordinary day in the June of 91 and it was always understood Rick that we lived above Mrs. Tweedy we looked after her my wife particularly looked after her and we had the group in our house and it was a sort of mutual understanding we'd stay there till she passed over um, that was our work by that time we'd been doing this for 10 years our children been growing up upstairs I always joke and say my son said the first words he ever heard spoken was shh they're meditating <laughs> and uh, and then one day in June I was standing in the kitchen it was an English summer's day a sort of rarity um, and I was hit by this incredible force of energy that almost threw me to the floor just out of the blue out of the blue and it turned my attention, it was as if it turned me from here to here and in that moment I knew that we had to go to America and we had to go right then mm. and I remember walking downstairs, it was just before the, the group used to come at three o'clock every afternoon, she was open from three till six and people came from around the corner and all over the world, it was an open house and I went in through the garden door into her apartment and I said, Mrs. Tweedy, you know, we have to leave for America um, soon. And she thought I meant to take a holiday and I said, no, we've got to go. And two months later, our few belongings were packed up, a couple of suitcases each, and uh, 
And we arrived in California to start a center here in California, and that was in 91. And America at that time was tremendously exciting spiritually, particularly California. It was where everything was happening, and and there was this light, there was this sparkle in, in, in the air, and it, really, it was really a wonderful place to be, and there was a spiritual freedom here that I loved. I, it was... Um, it was a, a wonderful place to come, and I used to spend you know, a couple of months a year I would travel around America lecturing, creating small groups over America, and it was really, really exciting, and that was, in a way, the next stage of my spiritual journey. I still went back to Europe a couple of times a year and sat with Mrs. Tweedy and discussed the work in America, but this was where my heart was, and it, it was a wonderful place to be. There's one thing you left out of your story, which is that I've heard you tell a number of times that you went into a six-month period of such inwardness that you practically had to be spoon-fed. I mean, your mother was <laughs> <laughs> your mother was taking care of you or something. What, what, yes. Tell well, us about that a bit. Is, um, you know, there is this phrase awakening, mm -hmm. and you know, my official awakening is say when I was 16, and I was in the London subway, and I read this Zen koan, and that. That was, it was like things went from black and white to color in 30 seconds. It was amazing. And then, um, and then I met Mrs. Tweedy and I began a different practice of meditation. And, uh, and in our particular Naqshbandi tradition, there's something called Uwaisi, which is one can have a connection to a spiritual teacher who's no longer present in the physical world. And, she told me after a number of years that she wasn't really my teacher, that her teacher, this Indian Sufi Sheikh Radha Mohan Lal, she referred to as Baisak, which means elder brother, he just liked to be called elder brother, that he was my teacher. And in fact, when I first arrived, she, she could, he had trained her while she was sitting with him, that he could reach her in meditation on a different plane of consciousness. And soon after I arrived at the group, he had told her quite specifically to leave me alone, he would look after me. She didn't tell him the things to me. I was a very intense, unbalanced 19-year-old. And just to be clear, he had left his body by that time. He was, he was communicating this to her from some other level, and she was, yeah, okay. Yeah, he passed on in, in 66, but he trained her that he could reach her from the other side. Right. And I didn't know anything about this at that time, but there was a very... When I was 23, um, there was a summer, and I was staying in a friend's apartment that looked onto this garden, and I, there was nobody there, and it, it was in August. I was a student, an English literature student at the time. And... I started to be drawn very, very deep inside of myself, complete exclusion. I remember I began that week sanding some bentwood chairs in the garden, and I would just sand these chairs and do the, the zikr, the repetition of the name of God. And But I got drawn deeper and deeper inward until the chairs were left in the garden, and I went inside into this apartment. And, and then there was this one day when I was taken into this incredible incredible pain within my heart and it was like the most painful thing I'd ever experienced and I was drawn and I would just go deep into this incredible pain and I would come out of it, it took as much as I could bear and this went on for hours I didn't think one could experience so much pain, just pain in the heart it was anguish it was sorrow, it was pure pain and then suddenly in a moment everything changed and I was made conscious on the plane of the soul or the plane of the self. And it was a completely, completely different state of consciousness. It was unbelievable. It was that plane is a plane of pure light, of pure bliss, of pure oneness, however you call it. And of course it was completely disorienting, Rick. It was com completely, completely disorientating. I had no idea what was happening. Nobody had outwardly prepared me for this. Nobody had told me this was happening. And um, 
And I started then to have a series of very, very powerful mystical experiences. And But I couldn't live in this world. I, my consciousness was completely somewhere else. It was absorbed somewhere else entirely. There was no time, there was no space. And luckily my mother offered to look after me. I'd been a student at the time and and she had a room at the top of her house and I just sat there almost for for six months. I, I was not in this world. I hardly slept. I didn't eat very much. And I was in this timeless space because in that plane of the self there is no there is no time. So I would sit all day in the same place. There is no space. So it didn't matter if I was here or there or, or anywhere. And there was just incredible states of bliss and other mystical experiences and gradually I was your was your mother a spiritual person so that she no, no, I mean did she make you see doctors or did she understand that something good was I'd happening seen, I'd seen some doctors before and eventually they you know they they said I was okay I could go and stay with her and they tried to give me drugs but I wasn't very keen on it nah. and um you know, she'd had a training in Jungian psychology. She'd read mysticism okay. earlier in her life, so it wasn't. Um, but I was just there, and I'd had this experience in August, and by March I began to come back. And actually, interestingly, I used the work of, works of Charles Dickens. That for three months I I read nothing but Charles Dickens, um, which kind of the thing is, what happens in those, I didn't know at the time, but what happens in those experiences, and Mrs. Tweedy wrote a similar description of her own experiences after her teacher died, when she said she was in such a state of oneness that there was no difference between anything. The dog shit on the, on the, the road was the most divine thing that existed. The consciousness gets completely absorbed into into oneness, and she actually, after her teacher died, she went to the Gandhi ashram in the Himalayas for six months, because the ego has to be reconstellated after that experience. It, it, it has been a way been shattered into a million pieces, and it's never going to be the same because it is no longer the the center of one's life. It is no longer the I that rules because it's been absorbed somewhere else and yet you cannot live in this world without an ego, without an I. And I know because I've tried. <laughs> Otherwise I am you. We are the same person. I am the table. I am the floor. I am the wind. I am the sky. You, you can't make any choices. There is nobody there to choose. How do you know what to have for breakfast? How do you know when to have breakfast? There's a How Sanskrit you... phrase, uh, Lesha Vidya, it's faint remains of ignorance, and it's said that living is not possible without that. You need that. Yes. You know, otherwise you can't tell your ass from your elbow, as the saying goes. Right, <laughs> completely. So <laughs> the ego has to get reconstellated around this different center of consciousness. and. Um, in a way, he, I discovered later, say it was my teacher who was no longer physically present, he'd, he'd made me conscious on the plane of the soul, on the plane of the self, and that consciousness remained. It, it wasn't a part. In Sufism, we have two things. One is a state, and the other is a station. A state is something that comes and goes. You have a state of bliss. You have a state of oneness. You have a, it, it is an act of grace, and it can last half an hour. It can last a week but it's a state, it comes and goes. You can get taken into a state of intoxication, a state of nearness with God, however you like to call it. And then there is what they call a station, which is where you arrived at, and you remain there until you get taken onto the next station. So it's, really it's really more of a stabilized, that. integrated sort of thing, a yes, station. Yeah. As, much as, it, as much as it can be, because right. certain mystical states can never be completely stabilized. Mm -hmm. And I remained there really for the next um, 35 years and um, and one has to learn how to live from a completely different perspective. You see life very, very differently and um, you know, for example, I started to have past life memories, the whole world, my whole life was completely different but I had also to come back down to earth, go back to college, get my degree, 
Um, I then got married, I had young children to run a household, all of those very grounding experiences. But that was really the, you know, when I was 16 I was woken up, but then there was no context, there was no container for that. And I think this is something that's maybe not so well understood in the West. You can have a spiritual awakening, which is fine, but unless there's a context, unless there's a container, what in Sufism you know, we call a tradition, um, then it very easily gets dissipated, you get confused, you get unbalanced. By the time I came to um, Irina Tweedy when I was 19, I was very confused and very unbalanced. And, mm. um, and she created a container for me to have a, a deeper awakening, a deeper inner experience. And then again there was a container, there was a tradition of how to ground that. And later, years later, when I started lecturing in America and I started reading Sufism, because at that time, firstly, there weren't any Sufi books if you didn't read Persian or Arabic, which I didn't. There were very few. Rumi hadn't been translated except by Nicholson, which is a very academic translation. I discovered later this Sufi phrase from one of the very early Sufis, Junaid, who lived in Baghdad. He calls abiding after passing away. Hmm. And there is this, you get taken out of yourself, out of the ego, out of everything that is familiar, and then you get to a place where you can live from it, which is abiding. So you, you find a certain grounding, not grounding in the ego, not, um, but you have become grounded enough so you can have a life. Because Sufism in Sufism, we, we have to live in the world, we have families, we have jobs, we have professions. Mm. That's um, great. <laughs> Reminds me of the Zen ox herding pictures, you know, where at some yes. point everything disappears and then eventually he's back in the marketplace. Back in the marketplace. Carrying his... It becomes enlightened around him. I wish it was so, so easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, thank you for that. Um, I'm sure we could, each one, many points you made could be a springboard for a whole conversation, but we want to turn our attention to spirit, mm -hmm. spiritual ecology. And, uh, in the introduction of that I read, um, you mentioned that in recent years your focus has been on spiritual responsibility in our present mm -hmm. time of global crisis, and uh, and that's nice because a lot of times when people are focused on spirituality, they they are so to the exclusion of worldly concerns and environmental concerns and social ethical you know so-called gross mundane illusory issues <laughs> and uh, not only yourself but a number of spiritual people or uh, teachers uh, have kind of begun to come full circle mm -hmm. and realize that it's not enough to just marinate in one's own inner experience that they're that they have a, a, a responsibility or a role to play mm -hmm. and in bringing that inner awakening to bear on issues that concern the whole humanity. Uh, and there's a number of beautiful essays in this book. I should mention Llewellyn didn't write this whole book. He wrote one of the essays. It's a compilation of essays from a, a number of different writers. And uh, Llewellyn was the editor and uh, compiler of it. So uh, if you were to... S I, I perceive a, a core theme coming up again and again in the issues in this book uh, in, in the essays in this book, which is that um, spirituality, in the, in the full sense of the word, <laughs> is the ultimate fulcrum or leverage uh, uh, which, by which um, more manifest problems can be influenced. Uh, is that a fair assessment of it all, do you think? Or to take it the other way, at the moment we are living in a state of global imbalance. Correct. We are destroying our own ecosystem at an alarming rate, whether you call it climate change, pollution, species depletion, however you call it. And I was drawn inwardly to find out what is the root of this imbalance? What is the, how did we get into this extraordinarily devastating state? And it seemed to me that we'd lost the relationship to what I call the sacred within creation in our Western culture. This is very different, of course, to any indigenous culture. Um, and it, in a way, has its roots in, in the West, in a certain Christ, Christian conditioning that God is in heaven and not on earth. And actually in the year 400, there was 
the Christian church banned paganism, any earth-based spirituality was um, was banned and the sacred groves were cut down, the, the, the temples were destroyed, the, the druids, the priests were killed. Um, and so we lost a certain central orientation which with of course Newton, Newtonian consciousness and then the industrial revelation, re revolution and then the globalization of its uh, progeny which is materialism, gross materialism um, has taken over our world and we need to return to our roots this is, Rumi says somewhere, return to the root of the root of your own self and so it seemed to me we needed to return to a relationship with the sacred within life, within creation, otherwise whatever we're going to do is going to reconstellate the same imbalance and um, the, the Zen Buddhist teacher Titna Khan, who's what's called an engaged Buddhist which means rather than a Buddhist who just goes into inner monastic retreat is very in, involved in the world he was asked what we can do most to, to help the world at this time and he says listen to the sound of the earth crying and it's like if we can go back to our spiritual roots within creation because look there is this mystical state of oneness we, it's a, whether you call it non-dual non -dual awareness or oneness you realize that you are part of everything, you are everything there is nothing separate, separation is an illusion it's all this extraordinary interdependent interconnected web of life and you are part of life, life is part of you, we are part of creation and in that sense I think we have a responsibility towards creation yes there is a whole spiritual teaching that you know you close all the doors, you shut all the windows and you go into deep states of meditation, you leave this world behind and I can say I've done that, you get to very very beautiful states there are, there are places of incredible light, incredible beauty and there is a temptation then to turn away from the world completely um, and you can do that, you can be absorbed into beautiful spiritual states and remain there but it seems to me that is not respecting something about the physical world into which you have incarnated and it seems to me that we have a responsibility towards this world, this beautiful and suffering world and I feel passionately that people who have a glimpse of spiritual awakening, of spiritual awareness whose spiritual light has been awakened, because that's what happens in spiritual awakening, this light of the self gets awakened the, it can be used in service to the whole we are part of the whole, we are therefore in service to the whole and the whole needs us because well there is this spiritual teaching that the world has a soul the ancients called it the anima mundi, the soul of the world the, there's a wonderful tribe in South America, the Kogi they call it Aluna and it is the soul of the world that is in really desperate need because of the harm that we are doing to the world it is crying and many many people hear it even without knowing what it is and what I have discovered is that through deep prayer, through deep meditation one can make a connection to the soul of the world to this inner spiritual substance in creation just like we have our own soul, our own atma our individual self that is also of course the universal self there is no difference there, it is oneness so while we are in this world we are also part of the world soul this, which, it is, which is in need at this time and we can make a relationship to it, we can become responsible spiritual citizens of the world yes there is outer action that is needed to try to heal the devastation we are doing that our materialism, that our consumerism, that our irresponsible behavior is doing to this beautiful world, this clear cutting of creation but there is also an inner and, and I don't know whether this is the right time to go into it Rick but what I find interesting or sad or even painful is that in the West we have now been given 
a certain spiritual awareness. Now, it wasn't there when I grew up. I remember in the 50s. It wasn't part of our collective consciousness. Spirituality didn't exist. You could become a Buddhist or a contemplative nun or monk, but spirituality, as we know it now, didn't really exist. And it came to the West in the, you know, with the hippie generation, with the Maharishi, and with all of the spiritual teachers who came from India. And we began to have access to the, the light of our own soul, to this incredibly beautiful spiritual self that we all have. And many of your viewers will, will have had that experience within themselves and it changes, you, you wake up, you wake up into a, a world of light like I did when I was 16, a world of laughter, a world of joy, a world of presence, a world of beauty, which is, you don't anymore just want the stuff of materialism, you want something else, your heart has been touched and you realize that you have a soul, you have an inner being, you have a spiritual self very different to just the physical self. And then sadly a lot of spiritual practices stop there. And they say, I have this inner magical, mystical, spiritual soul, this center of consciousness that is not just the mind, not just his thoughts, this awareness of presence. And it's a tremendous gift to be given that experience and it can only be given as a gift. It's always been a gift. As Hafiz, he says, what is all this love and all this laughter? It's the joyous sound of a soul waking up. And this is the, the tradition, it's a gift. And then people stop there and, and they stay with it, which is, which is fine, but there is always more, there is always a next step on the journey. And in Sufism we are taught that after the awareness of oneness becomes the station of servanthood. How can this awareness, how can the spiritual self be used in service to the whole, be used in service to life, be used in service to God, however you like to call it, there is no difference. Because once you have been given this gift, my sense is you have a duty to use it, and you have a duty to use it responsibly, which is why I use this phase, spiritual responsibility at a time of global crisis. It's not about you. You see, when you awaken into oneness, when you awaken into the states of non-duality, the first awareness is that it's not about you. This is... Then, what do you do with that awareness? It's not about you, so... If you believe in God, you can say it's about God. If you believe in life, you can say it's about life. If you believe in oneness, you can say it's about oneness. And just as you have a soul, you have an inner spiritual body, so does the world. And this is an esoteric teaching. It was known, of course, to shamans. Shamans who often say they, that their practices are to heal the tears in the inner world that we make through our outer behavior. It was known, of course, in Tibetan Buddhism, and the shamanism in Tibetan Buddhism, those deep spiritual practices they do with the spiritual body of creation with the spirits of the mountains, of the rivers, of the... Um, it has been known in many, many traditions, but somehow when spirituality came to the West, a lot of it stopped with the individual. It's my awakening, it's my journey, it's my soul, which of course it isn't. Well, I guess then the question is, um how could it be different? Um, I, I've been on a spiritual path for 45 years or something, and I spent 25 years or so teaching meditation, But mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'm doing this show, which is mm -hmm. something. But uh, but basically, uh, um, you know, other than recycling and, uh, you know, a few, <laughs> few little things like that, I'm not doing a heck of a lot to help the environment or the world. I still drive a car and fly on planes and, and things. So how does the uh, – and, you know, most of the quote-unquote spiritual teachers that I know are basically – doing spiritual teaching. They sit up in front of groups and they talk. And, and, so, <laughs> um, and so is the contribution that s 
so-called spiritual people can make largely an, es an esoteric one, an inner one, where they're just um, kind of enriching the collective consciousness with their awakening awareness and perhaps propagating that awareness to others who can then in turn enrich it? Or is there something even more concrete and manifest that one well, can do, aside from signing petitions and, you know... Yeah, I don't think, I don't think petitions have much, um, much, much clout. awareness. I mean, much right. help. I think the, the global corporations have a firm grip upon the, the outer political world. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, my sense in the past is that real change, my sense from the past and also seeing how things are, that real change isn't going to come from big groups. Mm -hmm. But from small groups of people, it is like an organic structure of life. I believe very much in life. I believe very much that there is a wisdom within the planet itself and that we are part of the organic structure of life. The, the difference is, is that people who have a spiritual awareness, there's a spark of divine consciousness in their cellular structure. And first of all, I think it is necessary to recognize the world is in trouble. The world is suffering and we have a responsibility towards it. That's the the first step that takes us out of me towards we, that takes us out of our own awakening, our own spiritual practice into an awareness of the whole. And then there is the need to to listen. That's why Titnat Khan, he says, to hear the sound of the earth crying. We are so caught up in doing. We need to listen. We need to be attentive. And the Sufis have what they call the listening of the heart. They see with the eye of the heart, they listen with the heart. And you listen within yourself. And then there will be a response. Because we are connected to the earth, it is not something separate. We are not a strange alien species that has been left here for a short while to go on to planet zero or somewhere afterwards. We are part of the earth, our spiritual body is part of the earth and we are needed by the earth. And I say this is what was always understood. That the Tibetan Buddhism is very deeply rooted in the magic of creation. Um, just like Zen Buddhism and Taoism, very deeply rooted in creation. You'd have to read Zen poetry or Taoist poetry. The, the wisdom of the Tao is, so, um, is deeply rooted in the patterns of creation. And we have to re-establish this connection that we have within ourselves and the soul of the world and the spiritual body of the world and we have to feel it we have to make a relationship with it this is part of the wisdom of the feminine um, to listen is also feminine we have to learn to listen inwardly as much as we watch outwardly and make a relationship with the a spiritual relationship with the earth with our soul and the soul of the world you you feel it because the the great I call it the great unspoken tragedy of this present time is that we have forgotten about the spiritual body of the earth, we have forgotten about the inner worlds, we have been censored. We live in a culture that has very, very efficiently told us that the outer physical world is all that exists. And even when we do spiritual practice and we discover our own inner spiritual self, it, there's a sort of blinker that stops us from then saying, well, this spiritual self we have must be part of the whole. And what is the relationship I then have to the whole? And then, once we make a relationship with the spiritual intelligence within creation, with the soul of the world, then we begin the groundwork. Then we begin the deeper healing, because, again, if somebody, or if you relate to your own soul, then you can heal yourself. And that is understood, this is part of New Age consciousness, if you like. That if you're sick and you're out of balance, you go within yourself and you make a relationship with your own soul and you bring yourself back into balance. Now, the, in indigenous cultures, they would use the same understanding in relationship to creation. They would, if it seemed that the tribe was out of balance, there was a sickness in the tribe, they would go within through their vision quests or their deep meditations or their shamanic journeyings and they would talk to the gods, they would talk to the spirits, they would find out what is out of balance and 
we need to do that because all of the technological innovations are not going to save our present situation. All of the recycling has gone too far. We've, we're either one minute to midnight or we're already past the tipping point. And those of us who have, a, who have been awakened, who have had a glimpse of a different consciousness that is not just a physical consciousness, I feel we have a responsibility to, in a way, create the inner stepping stones to a, a really sustainable, holistic life because sustainability for me is not just the sustainability of our present civilization, which I think is, you know, is living in a psychotic way, but is the sustainability of all of creation. Why are human beings allowed to dominate? Surely if we believe in oneness, then sustainability is about the sustainability of the whole. And then we start to bring things back into balance, and then we start to work together with creation from a spiritual point of view, and then maybe healing can be given, because as far as I understand, the earth is very magical, he is very mysterious. At this point in the interview, Skype quit unexpectedly. I restarted it, reconnected and resumed the interview, unaware of the fact that the audio on my side was no longer recording. So for the rest of this interview, you're just going to hear Llewellyn's remarks, except for a couple of points at which I recorded an approximation of the question I had asked him to put his remarks in context. What, I, what, what I'm saying is that when you are, when you've had an awakening, when this light of the self has been woken up, when you're aware of your soul, that you have a spiritual responsibility to the spiritual body of creation. Just like you make a relationship with your own soul, you should make a relationship to what is sacred within creation. And this, well, this is, again, first of all, I would say that the, the, the difficulty here, Rick, is that we have been censored from an awareness of the inner worlds that, for example, indigenous cultures have, and for example, they have in Tibetan Buddhism, many different, they're aware of many different inner worlds. And somehow, um, we have been in the West our rational mind, our rational education, and our whole present civilization has censored us from an awareness of the inner worlds. For example, in the, in the medieval time, they saw human beings as part of the great chain of creation, the great chain of being, it was called, that went all through all the angelic worlds, and human, humanity was just one part of this great chain. Now we, have, we see ourselves as separate from it. And the, it is like Titnachan, he says that, that we need a spiritual revolution as much as an, if we're going to resolve this ecological crisis, because at the root of the ecological crisis there is a spiritual imbalance. And just to take the... Um, okay, I, I can give you another example. If you, I work with human beings, I'm a spiritual teacher, and there is a way that you can change, or the human being, spiritual body can be changed so that their whole life then changes. And it, it is done, in Sufism it is done through what's called turning the heart. The certain spiritual energy is given to the heart chakra, which then turns the heart and the whole consciousness of the human being changes. And once that consciousness changes, then they will change their life because you see things differently. Your values change. You don't want to fight for things you don't believe in anymore. Your values change. You, for example, are maybe not so easily caught up in addictions or materialism because you've been given a different set of values. Yes, again, I would, I mean, I would take it in a different direction as to say that those of us who have a spiritual awakening have to be a little bit more revolutionary and say that then we have to interact with life from a spiritual point of view. That, you know, for example, once you have an awareness of oneness, once you've really experienced oneness, the Sufis call it the unity of being, then how are you going to interact from life with life from this place of oneness? And the difficulty is, is we in the West, we, have, we don't have 
a spiritual or mystical tradition to fall back on. As for example, um, in indigenous cultures, they have a shamanic understanding of that we are part of one part of many different worlds, and they have practices about how to relate to them. Um, and so, in a way, it falls upon us, upon those of us who have had an awakening, to then explore within ourselves and within the world, how can I make a contribution in, in the Western consciousness as the Grail legend, which is a very powerful myth. And Parseval, as a young man, discovers the Grail castle. But what is significant is he forgets to ask the question. And then the Grail Castle vanishes, and he has to go through many, many tribulations till he um, discovers the Grail Castle again. And then he asks the question, which is, for whom serves the Grail? And the answer comes back, the Grail serves the Grail King. And in the Fisher King legend, in the Grail legend, the Fisher King is wounded, and he needs to be healed. And when people have had an awakening, do they then ask the question, for whom does this serve? Do they ask it sincerely into the oneness in which they have been awakened? And then I think if you are sincere, you will get a response, because we are all, we are all part of this oneness of creation, and life needs us. It needs us to participate in its own healing, in its own redemption not with our own ideas, but with the deeper understanding that belongs to oneness. Because my sense, Rick, is this civilization is over. We cannot sustain it. It doesn't make sense anymore. It hasn't made sense for quite a long time. It's been running on empty. It's all the recycling, all the wind farms, all the solar paneling. We live in an, in an energy-intensive, consumer-driven culture that is is over, it's defunct. But then how, out of the debris of this civilization, how is a new civilization going to be born? Um, well, there are two questions. I do think that a lot of people who have a spiritual awakening, they get caught in the idea that it is their awakening, that it is their inner journey, that it is... And it's not, because... Um, a couple of years ago, somebody on a panel asked me about my awakening into oneness. I said, it doesn't exist. Oneness is awakening. You don't awaken. Uh, oneness awakens to itself. Life awakens. We are part of this cosmic explosion that we call life. Life awakens. And there is a danger in that we live in such an ego-centered society that people have an experience, then the ego gets hold of it. And it says, I am awakened, I have an awakening, um, which of course then limits the whole process. Because, um, as I say, one thing is to be awakened, the other is to stay awake and to use that awakening in service to the whole. Not just the language, the thought forms that are behind the language. And I actually feel quite strongly that a lot of the spiritual traditions that came to the West got caught up in a certain self-empowerment, self-development movement and lost a certain spiritual integrity that belonged to the East. They got caught up in Western individualism. Um, yes. And, but again, so what is the... I don't know what the future will be. I don't know what the next stage of human evolution would be. I've seen visions about its potential. Um, I think what is more important is that we keep a certain integrity at this time when so much is commercialized, when so much is exploited. Just as there is outer exploitation of the environment, there is inner exploitation of the environment. And that's why you have to stay true to something within yourself. I would call it the light of the self, or the love of God, to stay true to there, and again to think, how can I use this in service? How can this be used in service to the whole? Now in our tradition, we then turn towards God. We say to the Beloved, because for Sufis, God is the Beloved. We say, Beloved, how can I be in service to you? And in a lot of Sufi practices, learning to, in meditation, or just in daily practices, learning to to be receptive, to learn to listen, 
as a saying, we, I have placed my signs on the horizons and in themselves. And you learn to watch the signs, both in the outer life and in the inner life, to see where you can be of service. And I think that different people are called in different ways. Some people are called very obviously to be in service as a doctor or a nurse or a therapist or to work in, in the third world doing humanitarian work. I think there is also some people who are called to be in service, to be in prayer. There is a need to pray for the world. There is, um, I like Mother Teresa when she says, small things with great love. It's not what we do, it's the, the love that we put in the doing. Again, it's looking at it quantitatively rather than quality, quantitatively. One, one thing I've experienced on the spiritual journey is that Sometimes your outer situation remains the same, but the values change. And it's really, again, if you've been given the gift of awakening, what is your responsibility with this gift you have been given? Things are given freely, just like all this beautiful spiritual teachings came to the West in the 70s and 80s. Because when I grew up, they weren't here. What are you going to do with them? Who are they for? Are they just for our individual self-worth, or do they serve a deeper purpose? And how, what responsibility do you have to live that deeper purpose? And how are you going to find it? I don't. I believe more in, the, in telling people what to do. I'd rather say there is a wisdom within each of us that can take us, that can show us. The work you do, for example, is to do this Buddha at the gas pump. The work I do is to have a meditation group, the work somebody else does maybe to, to help with deforestation somewhere and to, or to help the regeneration of the ecosystem. Um, again, what matters is the attitude that we bring to it. Do we do it out of an ego-centered attitude or are we really in service? Are our hearts open? Or from another point of view, are we prepared to give it all up at a moment's notice? If the inner prompting comes, if something says you are now needed over here, or you now need to do this, or um, it is that certain freedom of spirit. But behind it all, we are, look, oneness, non-duality, it means we are all together. Nothing is separate. Nobody has their own journey. It doesn't exist. We're all part of this extraordinary story of creation while we are in this world, while we have a physical body. And we are all together in this. And some of us have been graced with an awareness of the light of the self. It's very beautiful. If you, I, as I told you, when I was 23, I was woken up so I could see it. I see it in a human being. I see that light. I know how precious it is. And how are we going to use it? What is our relationship to it? Are we going to be in service to it? And are we going to really live it in, in the deepest, most compassionate way we can? And then I think you will find that there are these groups of people around the world who are not necessarily big groups, small groups of people who are inwardly connected through the links of oneness, through the in a way, this organic web of light throughout the world and um, that enables us to have this conversation, that enables us, to, we share certain values. They are not religious values. They, they are deeply human values, whether it's compassion, loving kindness, understanding. And out of that, I think, a new era will be born, out of those deep human spiritual values that are, are our birthright, and if we can live from there, in whatever form they take, the form doesn't matter. At the moment we are just surrounded by this debris of a dying civilization with its malls, with its, its ridiculous patterns of behavior that have, I always think, are human beings really meant to spend eight hours a day watching a computer screen? No. Even if they're valuable for exchanges like this, we are these... We, we are made of stardust. We, we are here for just a few short years. What are we going to do with this experience? And how are we going to give our light back to life, that, back to the soul of life that needs it at this time because so much damage is being done? 
I know you appreciate that there are many levels of creation, not just the gross material world as people commonly perceive it and the transcendental field of pure consciousness, but also many relative strata inhabited by subtle beings such as angels, devas, elementals and the like. I don't perceive these myself, but I have friends who perceive them routinely and see many of them helping human beings in mysterious ways. Since the relative world is composed of polarities, there are also subtle beings which apparently don't have our best interests in mind. Would you say that the opposing influences we see displayed in the world, forces of good and evil to put it simply, are symptomatic of these more subtle beings engaging in some sort of cosmic struggle? Wow, that's a very big question. Need another hour to answer that. Yes, I agree there are multiple levels of reality. And until our present civilization, this was always understood. And in these levels of reality, there are beneficial forces and there are less beneficial forces. And um, one thinks of the angels who generally work together with human beings or like to help human beings. And um, then there are other forces that um, don't like us to evolve, don't like us to change. And many people see their handiwork in certain big multinational corporations that are degrading the environment or political structures that don't want change, that don't want humanity to evolve. And um, I, I think it's good to work together with those forces in the inner world that want to work together with us. In the same way as uh, something Mrs. Tweedy explained to me years ago, there are some trees that don't like people and there are some trees that like people. And you learn to, if you like to talk to trees, to be with the trees that like people and they can help you and they can, for example, absor absorb sickness from human beings and transmute it and to keep away from trees that don't like it. I think, again, if you ask with a sincerity of heart, look, the Sufis say, for example, that you can't go towards the truth without help from the other side. If you take one step towards him, he takes ten towards you. There are many inner beings that want to, that need us to look towards them for help, to help the world at this time. And they are waiting for us. And as I say, sadly, many people don't look towards them. They don't open themselves to that level of experience beyond their comfort zone. Well, it, again, we have been censored, and there is no other word to talk about it, just as in this... Other cultures have burnt the books. We have been censored from an awareness of inner beings, particularly in, in our Western culture. For example, if you go to Bali, the, the, the houses have little spirit houses, and those are not just for tourists. It's because every house had a spirit, and, and that was looked after. And in indigenous cultures, the shamans work with the inner beings. Um, sadly, for some reason, we have been denied that heritage once you have awareness of, I say there are many, many different sorts of, of inner beings. I've written about it in some of my books, different levels of reality from the angelic world, the devas, who are the forces behind creation and um, elementals. And um, yes, I mean, yes, I've had experience, particularly the angelic plane with incredibly beautiful angels that are here to help humanity. And, so, and many people have had experience. I mean, in fact, I recently read somebody who has worked a lot with dying people and there are often angels that help them and one of the angels said first about any situation is first you need to pray and then actions that come from prayers um in the in the bible there's this beautiful image jacob's ladder of the angels ascending and descending from heaven to, to humanity there there are many, many different levels of reality. And as I say, part of the poverty of our present culture is we look only outward and we don't have the training. We don't have the shamanic training about how to be with the inner world. I think that will come in the next age. There are many, there's much teaching and wisdom we have to relearn that was known to our ancestors. We focused on the outer world and the world of the ego. Um, and again, what, what is is I said oneness for me includes all the levels of reality because otherwise you have a very sensed oneness. It's just oneness on, on the physical plane. And if oneness doesn't include the angels and the devas and all the other beings, physical or non-physical, then what sort of oneness is it? 
In most interviews, I ask my guests what they see on the horizon in terms of their spiritual development. Most say it's a mystery that keeps deepening and unfolding. A few, whom I consider quite advanced, such as Adi Shanti, say that they always have a sense that they're just beginning. A few others can't relate to the idea of spiritual progress or levels of development. To them, such concepts seem to contradict the idea of non-duality. How do you see it? There is, a, there is a Sufi story about that one great early Sufi stood on the, on the edge of the shore and there was a woman beside him and he said, what is the end of love? And she said, love has no end because the beloved has no end. No, the, the journey continues. There is a Hindu saying, I think, about the knowledge of Brahma, thousands of years and thousands of years are not enough. And I think one of the great things about the mystical journey is one doesn't know and one's always just beginning. I'm beginning from where I am and there's always a, a new horizon. And it's only in the last 10 years that I was taken into the inner worlds when I was 30. In my early 30s, I worked with uh, archetypes with uh, certain powers in the inner world and then for seven years and then recently I was taken back into the inner worlds and part of my adventure at the moment is trying to understand these forces within creation, the forces within the world, particularly to do with the, our relationship with the world soul, with the anima mundi and this is a part of my journey that's really very much developing at this time, trying to understand what is our relationship with creation, how can we help creation in its time of need. Um, I do a simple... Um, well, that there is a need, and I do a simple, I teach a simple prayer for the earth, in which one puts the earth as a living being into one's heart and one's meditation, and, and offers it to God, or to the beloved, or to the oneness. Um, and I think this is, the, for me, this is the, the frontiers that need to be explored spiritually, because um, it is like the return. We Spiritually, you, you realize this inner state, and then how can you bring it back into your life, into your inner life? And, and this is very, very important, Rick, if we are talking about oneness, then our inner life has to include the inner life of the whole. There can't be my inner life separate from the inner life of creation. And I think we have to rediscover what that means. We have to reclaim our spiritual heritage. We have to go to the center of the maze. And in the, in the Chartre Cathedral, when you walk to the center of the maze, then you turn around and there is the rose window reflecting right into your heart. We have to rediscover our love for creation and what this means for creation, not just for us. We've become very self-centered in our spirituality and we are part of something much bigger than we realize. And I think we need to be able to embrace that. At least I try to, to um, always, you know, at the end of the day, I, I go into prayer and I say, you know, beloved, how can I be of service more? How can I be of more use to you. Where, where do you want me? Where do you need my attention? And to make this relationship, because it's the relationship that's got broken. And the, the beloved includes life, creation. It's not separate. It's the Sufis talk about intimacy, that he is nearer to you than your very neck vein, or the beloved is nearer to you. Than your neck vein, he's closer to you than yourself to yourself, Rumi says. And how can we bring back that spiritual intimacy into our life and into the life of the planet? And then, then I think something can happen. Then I think we can... You see, what matters to me is somewhere that we work together. In this moment, you and I, there is a connection. And when people view your programs, there is a connection. And out of that connection, something can be born. This is a, a network of light around the planet and here modern technology can help us because the internet and Skype make this available um, all around the world and we are we are all around the world there is no separation I remember actually seeing that when I was 17 I was traveling in the Philippines and it was the beginning of the hippie time and, and I met people and there was this connection because we were part of something that was beginning and I still feel it now, and I think it's very important. And how can we be of service to each other and to the whole? So, thank you for 
watching this somewhat um, disjointed interview. We had a few technical problems. Um, I've been wanting to interview Llewellyn for a long time. I have great respect for him, and I will certainly be interviewing him in the future. In fact, he just sent me another one of his books, which I'll read, and we'll have a discussion about that. But for those who've been listening or watching, <clears throat> you've been, this interview has been part of an ongoing series um, where you have over 200 interviews now, more to come. You can find them all archived at <clears throat> Buddha at the Gas Pump, which is B-A-T-G-A-P dot com. There you'll find both an alphabetical and a chronological list of all the interviews I've done so far. You'll also find a discussion group, and each interview has its own page in that discussion group, its own section. Feel free to join in. There's a link to an audio podcast in case you'd like to subscribe to this in iTunes and not have to sit in front of your computer to watch it. There is a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking if they feel motivated to do so. And there is a place to sign up to be notified by email each time uh, a new interview is posted. So again, thanks for listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.